Second Time Isekai has an impressively terrible first episode. Or should I say, an awful for It's not for a lack of trying or a lack of interesting ideas, but instead a poor, uncritical execution of its ideas. Second Time Isekai is effectively playing around with the notion of an Isekai power fantasy. Typically, an Isekai power fantasy involves a boy being yeeted into a fantasy world where he is incredibly overpowered and has women tripping over him for no adequately justified reason. But Second Time Isekai offers up an interesting explanation. What if he's been here before and already did all of the stuff that people love him for? Now, there are like eight problems with this idea, but let's at least acknowledge that this was something that was done with good intentions as an act of problem solving. It was very transparently seeking to make the world of this story feel more natural by papering over a pretty common hole in these stories. It now makes perfect sense for everyone he meets to like him without him needing to do anything because they already know him. And it makes sense for him to be overpowered because he already put in the work. There are characters like this in fiction, and even protagonists like this in fiction. They can work, but you need to make them work. An unavoidable issue with this type of intro to your story is that it necessitates a lot more exposition. You don't need to just explain how our hero got here and the world around them. You need to explain his relationships with everyone he meets and explain why those relationships make sense. You explain that this person already likes him, and you also explain that this is because they used to adventure together, and you need to do that for basically everyone and everything. You can't just explain that the kingdom is now at war, you need to have the hero think through an informed opinion on that based on his existing knowledge. There are ways of doing this. Fullmetal Alchemist did something similar, but spread out the exposition over the course of the entire start of the story and made liberal use of showing instead of telling. Second Time Isekai is an odyssey story, so they have to spread exposition over the whole thing as well, but a huge amount is front-loaded. The end result is exposition slurry. Information about the world is being dropped fairly dryly alongside info about the relationships with a bunch of characters who won't show up again until episode 5. It's just abysmal to sit through. He and his childhood friend, who we'll get to later, are dropped into a world where there's a war between knights and some demons, and he is able to use his immense strength that he has within this world to protect his friend. All of his friends are then enlisted into the army and trained, but he knows all he needs to already. We then go through three of his friends he used to adventure with, one by one, explaining what makes them them, and having him hear about the current state of affairs from them while they also make comments about how well they know each other and how he disappeared for five years and how they're now glad he's back. Setsu, the protagonist, stopped a war by uniting a bunch of nations in the past, but only five years later, the demon continent is waging war again, which seems odd, and they decide that the solution is for Setsu to go out and investigate. So they pulled a rushed and uninteresting heist to get him out of there, only for him to have a tearful goodbye with his childhood friend. Worth noting is that during none of this did he have any meaningful development with said childhood friend. This is one of the weaknesses of the choice they made. Yes, it does make logical sense why people would like him, but we never see any of the reasoning. It's just imparted to us via dialogue. So a tearful reunion like this might make sense, but it doesn't emotionally resonate. So, some of these episodes are bad, and some are atrocious. I want to take some time to talk about some of the better episodes, and why they are already bad, and then talk about the ways that the worst episodes are even worse. Episode 2 is one of the better episodes in the story. It involves Setsu helping out a girl who is going on a journey to finish the last job of her late grandfather. Early in the story, she is in trouble with a wolf, and he rescues her. She also gets in trouble with the guards, which he rescues her from, and she needs a ride to another continent, which he provides for her. Now, in my smartphone isekai series, I discussed save the cat moments, moments which are designed to emphasize the moral virtue of the protagonists by having them save someone in need, and this is an example of such a moment. But there are two problems with this. The first is that it happens too late. Episode 1 established everything about how all these guys love Setsu. But the show didn't, till episode 2, actually explain what is good about him. 
This is a trap they fell into with having everyone already knew him. It didn't feel necessary to actually justify their love of him until he met someone new, and as a result, we grow to like him far too late. The other problem is that, as moments, these are all so weak. In the smartphone isekai, all of the conflicts were easily resolved and mostly existed to make the hero look cool, but the story was at least about those conflicts. The show is about Toya going to a place, finding something wrong, and then fixing it. He then gets praise for having fixed it. But this episode isn't about this wolf or about the guards. They are small, almost incidental details. The story is about the fact that Setsu is good. The main arc is the girl learning to trust him because he's such a cool guy. And so the whole thing takes on an air of insecurity. The attempts at moralizing him feel not just shallow, but tacked on. It is inorganic. The story is also kind of about this girl, but the problem is that her story is basically non-existent. She doesn't grow or learn much. There is a soft lesson about realizing that not everyone is out for money, but there's never a moment where that thread is concluded or even put into sharp focus. She more just assumes Setsu is going to want something in return for helping her, and then he doesn't. The story is ultimately about the trust that forms between these two, which is shallow, but it is also wholesome and feels nice. There is heart here if nothing else, and it's a reason to enjoy this episode, but it still has really weak pacing, theme, and drama. Another of the better episodes is episode 5. We start with a flashback about why Setsu's childhood friend Yuhi likes him so much, which really doesn't show many specific details that don't involve him being kind of a dick. It's a lot of tell, not show. But then we get a plot point of her trying to improve her magic so that she can fight along Setsu. And one of Setsu's friends pulls her aside because she has a lot of promise. Yuhi is brought to a monster to see if she has the resolve to take a life as a final test of her worthiness. And she can't. She then talks with all of the other members of Setsu's original party, and they have some nice, interesting talks. In the end, she takes the test again, this time incapacitating the monster but still not killing it, declaring that her refusal to take a life is its own type of resolve, which is enough to satisfy the person testing her. Now, I'm upselling this a lot. It's much better said out loud than it is in practice. The characters are fairly flat, the pacing could use work, it leans too much on cliches, and everything feels a little bit shallow. It's a good concept for an arc, put into practice without many of the finer details a more skilled author would put in to give it depth. Every character's thoughts on things are very straightforward, not much is explored, it's altogether kind of middling. But it is functionally structured on both a thematic and narrative level. Especially because this is right after it's revealed to the audience that the war is being orchestrated by a shadowy cabal, and that we are currently in need of people willing to humanize the apparent enemy, just like Yuhi has just demonstrated herself to be. This is about as good as the story gets. Even at its highest point, it has potential but is ultimately dragged down by amateur execution. There's stuff here to enjoy, and it can be good trashy fun, but it's ultimately forgettable. However, there is a reason that these two managed to step above the rest, and it's because they never had Setsu interact with a love interest. <laughs> Alright, we need to talk about Setsu as a character. So, Setsu is an edgy, snarky hero who constantly throws out one-liners, but who has a secret, massive heart of gold. And he fights with both his giant sword and his giant brain. This is, in my opinion, the coolest archetype of character ever conceived. Basically, the closer you are to Lark from Arkrise Fantasia, the deeper I fall into bisexuality. So, yeah, if I was a cute anime girl in this universe, I, like every other cute girl in the show, would want to smooch this boy on the lips. But well, that's weird, right? Self-insert protagonists usually aren't characterized thoroughly enough that anyone would actually have a crush on them. But, more notably, in spite of me getting the appeal of this guy, the fact that every other girl in the show wants him romantically still feels forced, degrading, and downright unnatural. The reason for this is because of what I like to call Mary Sue Aura. 
I don't really consider this to be a Mary Sue story. I don't think the issues specifically surrounding its protagonist are quite severe enough for that, but he does contain many of the qualities of a Mary Sue. He is Sue-ish. Characters are simply written differently when they are in proximity to Setsu, and that goes double for this show's countless love interests. Yuhi is an excellent example of this. Her gentleness, when it is left in isolation, is a character detail that is shown to be both a weakness and strength of hers. Her kindness and innocence are explored, used to generate drama, and treated the way you would treat any other similar character trait. However, in episode 1, she's defined less by this gentleness and more by a devotion and affection for Setsu, which feels obligatory. She doesn't face conflict over her gentleness or use it as a means of solving problems or as a way of asserting her place within the cast. It instead feels like it was included as a form of appeal, to make her more trad wifey, essentially. We've all seen the character that Yuhi is, and she says all the generic, demure things that aforementioned character always says. It results in a character who feels like she does what she does because the author wants a character who does those things, just because it plays to a fantasy. In the presence of Setsu, she becomes hollow. This is even seen in episode 5, the episode where she gets room to breathe. Of all the parts of her character arc, the one which feels the weakest is her motivation to help Setsu. Despite the first quarter of the episode existing to justify it, it feels like an excuse. All of the substantive stuff of her getting to know him is brushed by in the narrative, and the only time we see him doing something for her, it's not that impressive, and was at a time she was already so infatuated with him that she was desperate to go to the same school as him. All of his allies are the same way. The girl who gave the test has an interesting dynamic where she is rough on Yuhi, but only because she's worried about her. And by the end, she's won over by Yuhi into believing that there are many different ways to be ready for the battlefield. The other two have philosophical conversations with Yuhi that lend depth to their characters. But with Setsu around, you get none of that from them because they're too busy exposition dumping about why it makes sense that they worship him. The girl who gave the test... Erica is maybe not the worst example of this, the worst example is definitely the Demon Queen, who we'll get to in a bit, but Erica is the most. You may have seen a certain clip of this show fly around, and yeah, she's kind of a lot. She recognizes Setsu only after he spanks her, at which point she gets subservient and sexually submissive. Her gimmick as a character is that she is an intense masochist, but it's masochism as understood by Erica Mitchell hopped up on meth. I want to draw a fine line here. I don't think that eroticism or the inclusion of fetishism is invalid within non-pornographic fiction. Narrative exists as a form of self-expression, and what one thinks is hot is a part of self-expression. The problem is that some fetishes mix with the conventions of storytelling better than others. If you include a tentacle scene in your story, it might be crass, uncomfortable, or unnecessary, but it will likely be thematically neutral. The problems come when you include fetishes which include the performative suspension of empathy, such as fetishes involving submission and domination, because the suspension of empathy is antithetical to character writing. Empathy is crucial for stories, and you can see that from two angles, a moral one and a pragmatic one. The moral argument for empathy is that a writer who is empathetic towards his characters is less likely to fill their stories with messages that are themselves unempathetic, and will be less likely to make people feel uncomfortable with the story's existence. The pragmatic argument is that empathy makes your story more compelling because it allows you to write more engaging and relatable characters, and it also widens the audience of potential customers. That being said, themes of BDSM and sexual subservience are not completely invalid either. They are simply tricky to handle. So I want to compare Erica to the character she's most likely inspired by, Darkness from the show Konosuba. Konosuba is a farcical isekai comedy, and both it and its characters are subcultural touchstones. Within the main cast, you have Darkness, a masochistic knight who is constantly obsessed with the idea of being ordered around and or forced to engage with sexual acts against her will. And like with Erika, this is played for comedy. <laughs> you fiend! You have chained this diabolical death curse to me, and the only way to remove it is to submit to your whims! You wish to defile me, don't you? What? 
There are many key differences, however. See, Darkness thinks being a sex slave is a hot idea, but she isn't implied by the narrative to be destined for sex slavery on any kind of metaphysical level. Anytime she is into something, it is a process of her asserting herself, of engaging in narrative agency, often to the dismay of everyone around her. Her lust is a vice that she actively pursues, resulting in comedic nonsense. The shock value of what she says, the reactions other people have to the shocking things she says, and the farcical and or satirical nature of situations which ensue are the source of the comedy. Erica, on the other hand, just is a PG-13 sex slave and you're supposed to laugh at her for it. The design of darkness and the situations she is put in are way hornier, way kinkier, and even more geared towards appealing to men than Erica is. But darkness doesn't feel like she was written by someone who hates women. And so, Erica is not funny, she's grating, she's distasteful, and she isn't engaging until her gimmick is dropped for episode 5 because Setsu isn't there to make her sexually submissive anymore. The issue of fetishes getting in the way of the story is not limited to here. The whole thing with the Demon Queen is that she thinks that the human army is invading her people, and so she is gearing for war. And so she agrees to a deal where, in exchange for her people receiving the funds and arms to survive the war, she will become this merchant's mind-controlled slave wife. Yeah, we're just doing sword art online. Ah, <sighs> well, I suppose I can forgive such trifles. You might as well indulge these base urges now. I can assure you that there will be none of that once the project is complete. You should see some of the housewife protocols the boys are cooking up. Somewhere between Leave it to Beaver and Hardcore Porn. Woof! So, how exactly is that gonna work, by the way? Am I gonna, like, have a remote? We going by Alexa rules? Or are we just doing a full Stepford? This is clearly a kink thing, and as is predictable, her role in this as someone who is going to get enslaved by an enchantment curse ruins any potential her character has. Not only does she go along with the dumbest plan in the world as suggested by the shadiest guy in existence, not only is her entire motivation framed around wanting to keep a promise she made to Setsu to keep the peace, but she doesn't do anything to try and change the situation or turn the tables or even negotiate better conditions. Setsu's Mary Sue aura and the author's horniness team up on this character to make her as unengaging as humanly possible which sucks because she gets an entire focus episode and I have been on this point so long I'm not even gonna go into the beast people who are all looking for a master like ah it is worth stating that besides the somewhat likable main character there is one character that I have positive opinions on and that's Leviah the sea goddess. She is his main traveling companion in the story, carrying him across the sea on her back before going into human form and joining him to adventure on land. She is, frustratingly, also romantically interested in Setsu, but she also feels like she's allowed to be her own person on top of that. She's resistant to the Mary Sue aura. Not immune, but resistant. She really comes off like a proper teammate, helping with fights, helping come up with ideas, and bickering with him. There are all these moments like her complaining about all the chauffeuring she's doing and him having to bribe her with cookies, and it's all just a little bit charming. In any other show, I would have shipped the hell out of this, and the moments she's tsundere for him would have been cute. But in the context of the rest of the show, I don't see a cute romance. I see authorial intent for every important woman in this world to be obsessed with Setsu, and it all starts feeling fake. There's another important female character who I found to be fairly tolerable. Elise shows up in episode 6, apparently an old pupil of Setsu's, and while he does act somewhat paternal towards her like he does with every other female character, it's at no point implied to be romantic affection she holds for him, which is refreshing. But really, that's all there is to say about her that's remotely noteworthy. Like, the whole episode is a kind of lukewarm mystery about wondering what was happening in a village where people seemed to vanish into thin air each time a dragon showed up, and she was the one initially investigating it. 
She certainly seems to care about people and have some generic level of determination, but she lacks any noteworthy details. She is introduced with a nickname implying she cries easily, but we don't see that to any pronounced effect within the story. She's just so... flat. But that's not even unique to her. The little girl that follows Setsu around is fairly generic and is mostly just a wellspring of shallow, wholesome moments to draw from. The Demon Queen's most notable personality quirk is being in love with Setsu. This cat girl he befriends in episode 7 is really mostly defined by her desire to save her sister, who's just a generic nice person. You get the picture. This isn't an all-encompassing problem. There are definitely characters with effective characterization like Levia, but they are on the far side of the bell curve here. The story just has a lot of uninteresting characters and characters who consist mostly of spouting cliches. This is a problem which ultimately winds up tying back to Setsu. He's largely defined by his relationships with these people, and as a result, he himself is weakened by their own flat characterization. The fact he is this person's teacher feels way less meaningful when his pupil is so boring. The dynamic does basically nothing to flesh him out. We don't see how teaching someone was a challenge for him, or how this person taught him more about himself, or anything like that. On the same level with the Demon Queen, we don't know much about what it means for him to have forgiven her and offered her an olive branch in their backstory after defeating her in a fight because she is so wholly defined by the adoration she feels for him in the aftermath. Second Time Isekai has an ensemble cast and spends a lot of time dedicated to introducing all these different people, but it just doesn't work. Like with episode 1, a lot of time is dedicated to justifying them liking Setsu throughout the show, but it's such an uninteresting cast of characters that it's not even worth the effort. You basically get the same effect from a crowd of people chanting his name, and you can get that done during B-roll. The fight scenes within the episodes reek of bad adaptation. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that they're unforgivably bad, but they hardly stand out from the quality of the rest of the show. It's a lot of small things. For example, in episode 6, Elise and Setsu do some sort of plan, but it's unclear what they're doing. Elise runs at the dragon, parrying some of the fire blasts, before grouping up with Setsu, where the two of them dodge back into a crater that the dragon then slips on. This is the kind of thing that feels like it was originally written with some kind of narration explaining the plan, but since no one said it out loud, it was just left to the subpar visual storytelling. There are other issues as well. There's some amount of Naruto syndrome where a lot of stuff is said and narrated during moments of action, something which feels natural enough in written media, but which is difficult to execute in motion media due to the fact that time is a lot less plastic. It feels like the action stops. There's also this odd quality to the blocking sometimes. In literature, you don't actually draw out the battlefield. Instead, characters occupy conceptual spaces within a fight. Someone is in front of their enemy, or hiding behind a rock, or something equally abstract. When translated into a visual medium, this can look kind of awkward, with people's fighting styles being sort of static. All the implicit motion and dynamism, which got excised from the prose because it was, well, implicit, is simply absent altogether, leaving everything feeling stiff and just a little bit off. There were a lot of adaptational changes to the plot as well. Things were added and things were cut. A lot of the cuts were welcome ones. The bully who picks on Setsu, but who also has a crush on Yuhi, and who gets emasculated every time Yuhi openly simps for Setsu, is not missed, nor is the scattershot expository narration of the magic system at seemingly random times, like when it goes out of its way to explain how this one magical eye power differs from a magical eye power used in chapter 1. Erika and Yuhi's relationships with Setsu are even more unbearable, with the cringy aspects of them being given a lot more moments, and not much else is added to make it more bearable. Yuhi's internal monologue is of particular note, because she just won't shut up about how much she loves Setsu. Like, the anime toned her down a lot. Also worth noting is that they changed a pretty big thing in the anime with Setsu's allies. Setsu still got Erika to remember him by spanking her in the original, but the way he got the blonde knight to remember him in the book was by giving him a nutshot so hard that it couldn't have been given by anyone else. And I don't even know how to process that one. 
For all the stuff they cut out of the first arc that took up episode one, they really stretched what came after. Setsu's journey with the little girl in the port town was originally really short. There's no waffling about in the town with the guards, he just goes straight to the ocean to hitch a ride with Levia. It's a little funny, right? One of the best episodes was one that the anime studio essentially cooked up themselves, but that's really, really unfortunate because this story that they told is also really bad. It's just not as bad as the source material. There is a certain degree to which the source material brings it down, but the guard plot is in isolation, meandering, devoid of tension, and thematically messy. One of the things which really bothers me about the original is Setsu's characterization. He's nastier in the books, his more edgy, misanthropic side feels like a facade or an aesthetic in the anime, but in the novel he's just a lot meaner. His internal monologues are more patronizing towards Yuhi, often judgmental, really condescending towards Erika as if he feels he's entitled to her as a literal slave, he's very sadistic, and there's just this weird lack of self-awareness. I can totally see anime Setsu saying, ugh, saving this person is a pain, but it'd leave a bad taste in my mouth if I didn't. But him thinking that makes him seem like he's at the start of his character arc. Like, it feels as if he is in the process of learning to like other people, but he already went on a coming-of-age adventure in this world. He should have a more mature thought process here. It really hammers in the fact that he acts edgy not because that's a character trait of his, but because the author is edgy. The author doesn't just think it's cool to say stupid stuff like this, he thinks it's cool to think stupid stuff like this, because he and the audience do think like this because they are at least spiritually edgy teenagers. Alright, so there's a lot of stuff I just didn't know how to include, so I'm just gonna ramble them off here. For starters, the little girl has this really weird thing going on with her personal arc. Like, her grandfather went on this whole rant about how you need to protect what was most important right before sending his daughter on a dangerous odyssey she nearly died on several times so that she could complete a delivery for him so his last piece of work wasn't left undone. And like, no one ever questions that. Also, she has a crush on Setsu in the book and I'm glad they removed that. The pacing is just abysmal. The time in the kingdom is twice as long as the Demon Queen arc in the book, but in the anime, the Demon Queen arc is like two or three times as long, which sucks because the Demon Queen arc is just atrocious. Like, it was such a slog. The whole thing is very JRPG-like, where he goes to a town on the way to the important thing and solves a problem there before moving on, but the whole thing takes away from the sense of urgency. Like in episode 4, the demon army no longer wants to invade the humans because they learned that the war was being orchestrated by a cabal, but in episode 5, the human kingdom is mobilizing to invade, and then the next episode just focuses on Setsu getting up to some nonsense with the cat girls. So what's the verdict? Well, obviously the anime is bad. It's got bad characters, and a bad plot, and bad pacing, and is really kind of gross, and it isn't funny or exciting or even weird enough to be of worth as a curiosity. I'd personally skip it. If you want to see me continue to lose my mind at bad anime, then like and subscribe with the notifications on, and if you want to help me do this for a living, then you can support me on Patreon. And a big warm thank you to my patrons. Bellman and Carolyn Vig. I hope you guys enjoyed seeing this one a little bit early.